Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny podcast. Uh, as is usual, Rob Hirschfeld is with me. Uh, good day, Rob. Stephen, hello. Hello. And uh, today we have, um, we have a great guest because he has a podcast that I'm jealous of, as we were talking about previous <laughs> recording. Uh, Yadin, and Yadin, I'll, I'll let you say the rest of your name in a second because I don't want to screw it up. I, and you're with Druba. And I like your title because it doesn't end. Head of content, community, evangelism. And I'll, I'll just add all other things important. How's that? That's and, perfect. I love it. <laughs> and then uh, he runs a podcast called Welcome to the Tech Village. And uh, certainly, you know, as podcasters, we always try to bring on other podcasters and do cross podcasting promotion. But uh, Dean, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your podcast, and then we'll jump into uh, the topics for today. Well, I have to say, I love that intro, Steve. That was fantastic. Uh, yeah, the title as well. Uh, it does have an ending on my email signature, but uh, I like I like all of the things. It's great. Head of all the things. I'll just I'll use that one moving forward. Uh, so yeah, as as you uh, so eloquently uh, set up, I am one of the co-hosts of the uh, Tech Village podcasts, and with my illustrious hosts, uh, Matt Oswalt and Lauren Malhoyt, who I absolutely love. Fantastic. Shout out to them. Uh, and also, I think from, the, from a community standpoint, um, the also uh, founder and sort of chief uh, advocate of the Level Up project, which is a, uh, it's just a really, really fun project where we uh, create a lot of great content for the community, you know, by the community, for the community, uh, and, uh, and level up all the things. Uh, so, um, so, yeah, having, I'm having a lot of fun having a lot of fun that always comes through in a podcast when you've got a good team and and yeah. and that one i you know i, I recommend I, I love listening to podcasts and, and uh i like your vibe on community and people um in from a tech perspective i think that's really helpful so. yeah well it's always people first technology second technology just happens to be what we have fun doing all day makes perfect sense to me um and, and I, you know, we, we have a, we have an interesting take for us, right? We try to be sort of conversational. And so we let the passions of the person that we're talking to guide us. Um, and you came on to our, you came onto our radar uh, because you and I got into, um, I would almost call it, it wasn't a, a Twitter fight. It was more like a, <laughs> a Twitter, a Twitter uh, back padding, may, maybe not too crazy. Not a rant, Rob. Yeah. So. Not uh, oh, I love rants too, but no, no. You a, Twitter, a Twitter flitter. Rants. Twitter flitter. <laughs> oh, we flirted on Twitter. Yeah, a flirt. Exactly right. Exactly right. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it was it was good too, and and, uh, and I I always try and be a little bit reserved when I jump on other people's podcasts too because I don't want to take over the mic and just kind of hog it as I, I and, and I try to take a little bit of a back seat and let the uh, let the other podcasters drive. But yeah, no, we had a we had a we had a, a good conversation on, on Twitter, and and you opened my eyes to a, a couple of different things, and and I always was you know I think it was the whole root of it was. Uh, was it uh, community and, and code meeting at, moving at the speed of the community or community moving at the speed of code? What would, uh, what would you say, Rob, was that, that the core of that? So, so we, this, this came up in a really sort of backwards way because we were, we were talking about uh, you know, uh, Kubernetes is, uh, was part of this and OpenStack too. And uh, um, this is related to a blog post I wrote about how Kubernetes is not following OpenStack's community patterns um and then sort of that that's been sort of having some some echoes uh every once in a while and so one of the things about about code and community in these projects is that we have a tendency to think of the code as like moving super fast and we're releasing every quarter and <laughs> wow you know we're gonna change we're gonna change the world every release um <laughs> and, and and it's, it seems uh, like that from the outside. I think you gave me some good perspective on that. Yeah, and then we and then we have this this idea that the that the, the community is the rock and the stable thing, and it's it's going to be there and and you know really make things go. And and the funny thing for me, I mean, we chase the operator side of it, um, is that I actually see a lot of times the opposite. Right, the community comes and goes every quarter, um, and then the code is is left is sort of le it's not left behind it's not orphaned but we have a tendency to think through the longevity of code and how hard it is to make even small changes um once code is is deployed and once it's in use um you hurt people um 
and I actually mean that in an almost literal sense. You can hurt you, you you hurt people when they when you make changes to to code bases that that weren't right, they didn't anticipate, or maybe were the best thing since sliced bread. But um, <laughs> is that kind of like but telling people cost, cost baby that, like telling people that their baby's ugly? Um. It's, or maybe, I think maybe just yeah. swapping out their baby and they come in and wait a minute. That's not my baby. <laughs> so, so I, I, I'm going to, we're, we're going to, I want to dig in on, on, this is our topic, right? And, and I think you and I are both podcasters. So we'll, we'll, let's flip the mic back and forth, um, push on each other in, in these areas. Um, what do you mean by the, your baby's ugly comment? Cause I'm really curious um, how you decompose that. Yeah, well, I think some people can can come at certain projects and whether that's code or whether that's, you know, an architecture and uh, or that's an application, you know, in, in general and basically think that, you know what, I'm so proud of this and they just, they're beaming and they, all they can see is the lovely elegance of, you know, their perceived elegance of their code and they may not see some of the inefficiencies uh, of it. They may not see some of the, the resource hawking or the buffer overruns or any of the other stuff that you know, <laughs> may have happened, uh, but they're just, this is just beautiful. It's wonderful. It's uh, like you said, the best thing since sliced bread. Uh, and then someone else comes along and said, mm, yeah, not so much. Uh, there's that and there's that. And then people immediately sort of, you know, go into their corner, like, you know, they, they pout and they sort of cross their arms and they make that little scrunchy face. And they're like, Gee, well, it's, uh, you try and write something better. <laughs> <laughs> and then they, and they do, and that's called a fork. And yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, exactly. Exactly. So, I, I mean, I, I think, I think that there's definitely a need for people in open communities, writing code in open communities to um, sort of check their ego um, because the utility of the code means that people, you know, this is my classic, right? A good UFX is one that people show up and complain about the colors. Yes. Um, right, that's, 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 that's the mark of success. It's like, it's like, it's like they, you, know, you look at the UX and it's like, I hate your icons, they're, they're crap. Who made these icon choices? And, and you, so I'm yelling. Yeah. Um, and you're like, but it worked. It's beautiful. You didn't even notice. And and that's good UX design. That's good project design. Oh, so I, like, you, I like that yeah. angle. I like that perspective. Cause yeah, that's like, those are your only problems. I like, I like an analogy I always like to use in that case. It's like, if you're like, you're in Silicon Valley and, and, and you, you don't have really, and the only thing you're complaining about at your job is you're, you know, you're standing in line maybe for this catered lunch that happens to be brought into the <laughs> office. And they're like, this is, again? A, this is a long line. I'm like, this is, this is what you're complaining about? The fact that you're in a line that's going to last five minutes to the catered lunch at your Silicon Valley <laughs> office, you have no real problem. No problems at all. Uh, and I've literally yeah. actually like put my hands up and just said, hey, everybody, just so you know, we don't have any real problems. And everyone's like, yeah, you're right. So I think that's that, that UX uh, you know, experience too. Yeah, if they're just complaining about the icons, then your application doesn't have any real problems. Right. And that's, um, Packet actually did a, um, a Twitter, Packet.net, one of our, one of the, the companies that we'd like to collaborate with because they do bare metal hosting, um, did a nice list of, um, you know, go after, things to go after, sort of an ordered list, right? And they were saying, look, you know, it has to function, it has to be performant, but there's a sequence of these things and, and, you know, making it beautiful is, is, is super important. Um, and actually it wasn't at the bottom of the list. Um, and so you have to, you sort of have to tweak that, but I have, I have the same concern. I'm interested in your position on community. Your baby is ugly. Your community mm -hmm. is ugly. Um, yeah. and how to give that comment, and how people should respond to it. Mm, yeah, well, I think there should be a lot of humility and a lot of inclusion when people are building communities because communities are just these living, breathing things that need lots and lots of different people to contribute. Uh, I think there's a lot of openness, um, but I, my, my curiosity though is, is when, uh, when you're looking at uh, sort of the, the, these coder communities and, and finding people who don't feel like communities broken or feel like community i mean do you find that do you find that people are like no this community is great it's working great the governance is awesome you know uh you know any of that dysfunction that you're talking about really is just an artifact of maybe a couple of bad actors and it just doesn't matter i mean because that's because because most a lot of my experience has been just you know anytime anyone comes in everyone's opening you know sort of got these open arms and saying yes please my goodness you know uh tell me where you know where we can do better and 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 come and pitch in and you know grab a shovel and start you know start scooping whatever you can. I don't, I don't know. Well, Rob, um, I would, I, I would jump, I'm going to jump in here because yes, I actually don't think 
I think the majority of people in a community don't see the problems because it's people that are either leading the community or really focused on where it's going, its value, things like that. You're, there's a level of involvement beyond just the code. And I think there's different types of people watching it because Rob's an example. We always pick on OpenStack, but um, you know, it's, it's we, obs we obsess on OpenStack. Your Rob does. We I, know I, it. I, I, we, we, we know, know it. it. We love it. We help build it. But yeah. I would say that probably the majority of people on OpenStack don't see half or even more of what we saw because they weren't looking at it in the same way. Interesting. In when this because they don't want to look, or because they just no, because it's they're there. They're either using the tool, or they're writing the code, and helping people. They're not interested in oh, what happens to this in two years. How does well, you know what? I think a lot of people don't. I know. I I think that that one of the things about the the shiny allure of open source can be that you you feel like you're doing a a community good or your 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 employer who doesn't might not understand open source has sort of given people free reign to go do open source um, and you can cargo cult into the idea of the, the the good of open source community and projects and software and i'm going to commit treason right now <laughs> go for it without without thinking through who is going to pay the salaries of the people building it? And so I, I want to be, I, when, when we're talking about open source, right, we, we, are, we are talking about data center infrastructure, open source software and DevOps Cor tools and things that, that provide software. business value. They run companies. Um, and so you, you, you need to, if you're running, if you, if you have open source software running a company and, and your business line of command is not asking who is paying to maintain that software. And if they're not writing a check to maintain the software that they're using, either in their own employees or in a, a, you know, vendors sustaining the community, then they have a business continuity problem. Um, and I don't think that discussion is very well had. And I think people showing up in open source communities asking that question are often perceived as, as outside of the community. Um, you know, or maybe trying to impose some sort of uh, sort of business overlord kind of uh, perspective on the entire thing. And <clears throat> I mean, when someone talks about that, is it do people come and say, you know, this you're 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 making me feel dirty. Let's not talk about business or writing checks. Let's just companies are not allowed in open source. They're evil. Yeah, even they're, though the big yeah. corporate open source is about companies. Yeah, and and the the challenge you get into if you're not careful is you get uh, companies. And I'll name Amazon because they're often uh, held up as as the example here um, of companies that use a lot of open source technology and then don't contribute back into the ecosystems. And Amazon has been really adjusting with this, um, right? Adrian Cockroft has been leading some examples, and I, I, they just hired Bob Wise to come and uh, be much more active in the Kubernetes community as contributors, but historically they've used open source technologies offered them as services and monetized them that way um, and then left the founders of those projects or the contributors for those projects um, un, unprotected, I guess, from a financial perspective. And I'm yeah. sure I mean, we will generate hate mail for that, but yeah. well, there's a lot of IP that's created in, you know, in open source, but it's not, that's the classic idea of what IP used to be. Uh, and I think a lot of right. people are, and, and this is just, I mean, this has a whole, I mean, international implications as well. Um, I think you guys, uh, I believe you guys had had conversations about, you know, China using open source and U.S. companies mm -hmm. generating the open source and open source. Jim, Jim Plabundin is that the was a Fantastic conversation about that. And, and I don't think that's one thing, the first time I'd ever heard of that, that subject or that conversation was, was when you guys talked about it. And I think you're absolutely spot on that that conversation's not being had because people are, are just in two or just feeling that they're, they're, they're wanting to do it. They're believing in the efficacy. They're believing in the value of it. And there is value, but there is, there's some very, very critical questions that aren't being asked. So, so I'll go to jump in and just say that was your takeaway from Plumundin's talk. I'm happy because I worry <laughs> about all the other chaos in Plumundin's talk. <laughs> 
but, uh, well, I love I loved Soviet Russia. Uh, I mean, enterprise software that was a wonderful. So I just want you to know oh. what I, I worked with him for a year when I was at Rackspace, and I booked an hour and a half every Friday to just sit and talk with him. And it didn't matter what happened in my career, <laughs> anything. Just imagine you have that guy for an hour and a half every day. Oh, and if uh, you could have seen his mustache, which is genius, uh, it just is it is it anything like Alistair Cook's mustache? He's <laughs> Colonel Sanders. Just he's <laughs> Colonel Sanders. Oh, there he goes. Goes. The other direction. And, and, all right, I and, went the other way. And that and that that podcast was like a bumblebee going to flowers. It was oh. just so much fun. It was just like every. It was great. Um, anyway, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> pull the back. Sorry, the, the, the uh, no, I, I'm glad you the. Um, because I, I, I think that in these communities, the open source communities, we, we need to figure out how to create a core. And I did a lot of work with OpenStack around core and, and K- Kubernetes has an ongoing conversation about this. What the core is, what the part that, that open source is commoditizing, because that's really what you're doing in open source. You're commoditizing exactly. whatever core idea is. And then around that core, you, you need to make that core small enough that people can walk in commercially and, and get a benefit from it, either from a directly using it or an ecosystem. And, and that's what I just said is, is hugely controversial for some people. Um, but I don't know how we're going to sustain open source projects without having this very, this very frank conversation. Hmm. Um, yeah. And I'm going to, I'm just going to go on a limb here too, because what, what that, that conversation that you guys had previously about, about open source really, uh, it what it did is it put a seed in my mind about the future of open source. Now I'm already already getting a little hand wavy here. The future of open source and the viability of that future within a framework in which certain actors globally are going to be are looking at those open source projects in very very different ways than those who started them uh, with very different intentions uh, when they're joining those. And I don't know if that is that a conversation that's being had as well because it it does seem like there's there's some there's some jeopardy in there or the, the future of certain open source projects is in jeopardy because you're going to start have, having this sort of globalization business pressure component. And maybe, maybe that's a conversation that's worth having. It, it is. I mean, so one of the things, uh, and this, this podcast will air um, later after the event, but just in the recent, just recently, uh, core OS was purchased by Red Hat. So two big Kubernetes players um, and somebody produced a graph that um, chart that I felt was, it was very powerful. They showed um, all of the SIGs, the special interest groups that are in Kubernetes. So just history, Kubernetes, a lot of the work being done in Kubernetes is done inside of special interest groups that have a focus on code development in one area um, or you know, a, a related component like testing or doc writing or scaling or multi-site Kubernetes coordination or all, all that. Um, and with the acquisition of CoreOS, uh, Red Hat has the lead in half of the six. Uh, and so there's this, you know, control commercialization question because Red Hat's commercializing Kubernetes and OpenStack very well. Um, and kudos to them for doing it. Um, yeah. they, they seem to have figured out the magic, but it, yeah, they seem to be able to ride those, those open source waves. They, they certainly do. Um, yeah. yeah. And I know there's a lot of, I know there's a lot of good con- conversation with like, uh, with Tyler and, and Brian, um, mm-hmm. uh, who, you know, pod cuddle. Pod yes, the pod, pod cuddle or pod, apparently they're until the, they have to call it the pod CTL, but no, I don't think Brian's getting on not, board. Not, I'm not on my podcast. <laughs> I know. Come here if you want to talk cuddling, uh, not, not, not controlling. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, I think, and, and and you you don't see. I mean, they have you know. The, the, there seems to be a lot of very very positive connotations when you talk about Red Hat and the Linux Foundation and uh, and some of the open source things that, that they're doing. In fact, you know, a lot of people love for a lot of love for Red Hat uh, is out there. But there, I th- I think there's there seems to be uh, a, a shift, and I and I don't I don't really know how to describe. Maybe you can help me kind of sort of describe that that shift in the way that that companies like. Red Hat, these for-profit companies are riding these open source waves and some of the different ways in which companies are now riding those open source waves. And it just feels like there's a shift in the way that, you know, that happened in the good old days of, you know, Red Hat and Linux versus what's happening right now. 
What do you mean? A, a shift in the, what, what, what's the good old days? Uh, the, well, I, think, I guess it's the relationship that these companies kind of could go back to the beginning of the conversation. It's the relationship that these companies and the developers that they pay around the salaries of the, you know, pay the salaries of the, yeah. these developers, that relationship that they have with open source um, where you've got even companies now like Microsoft, you know, um, and open source, it's becoming, I don't, I wouldn't use the word mainstream, but a lot of people are seeing the business efficacy of so, engaging in, so, in the open source community. So do, you, do you think that the Red Hat, the people consuming Red Hat are, you know, it's all open source stuff. Linux is open source, but they're really consuming it as a, as a user, not as a contributor, not as part of that community. It's sort of like open source, yay, checkbox, but I'm going to buy it. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not part of the community where I'm peripherally, peripherally part of the community. Yeah. Well, isn't, isn't that why they go to Red Hat in the first place to buy it? They want the product. They like that it's open source and Red Hat get, handles that so, for them. So here's an interesting sort of think, thought about it, right? There's, there's a, a cadre of people in companies that want to use open source, right? They go out, they're, they're, they're like me, they're Linux on the desktop crazies and right there <laughs> we're on our team right i'm not running bsd or anything um but uh the you know but so they they believe very strongly a lot of them are you know the developer side of this equation um and then they show up at the company and the, and historically to yadin's point they said i can't use this open source stuff i need a vendor and you know they turn to red hat and red hat becomes the vendor and so both parties are happy um happy enough um, right, the, the open source people are like, I'm using all these open source tools, it's great. And the company's like, I'm not vulnerable to open source tools, I've got a vendor supporting me. Um, seems like actually a pretty good compromise. Is that is that what you were thinking? Is that sort of the, the model? No, I think, I mean, that's sort of the, the current classic consumption model right now where you want to basically one throat to choke, you want the support, you want to make sure that you've got a trusted, basically it's more building a trusted relationship who just, with someone who just happens to be using open source. I mean, people who, who might you know, be consuming platform nine they may not even care that there's OpenStack in the back end. Um, they're just, you know, they just want somebody who can trust, you know, these people who have built something, see that it runs in production, see that it scales. Uh, I guess maybe I'm, and, and, and I'm just asking, I don't have an answer to this. I'm just asking a question where it, it seems like now that you have companies like Microsoft and, and you, have, you have so many of these open source projects uh, and so many different companies who are engaging at a large scale, uh, in open source and seeing that as a part of their business plan and, and looking at it from a strategic standpoint, is that changing the relationship or changing the way in which these communities work? Uh, because now you have community advocacy groups and, and you have a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, corporate yeah. sponsorship. Is it, is it changing the way that, you know, that, that these communities operate now that there's a, uh, an evolving relationship between larger companies and the open source community? So, it's, I think we need to figure out how it is going to work because like an open stack and there are people who will swear that, that what I'm about to say isn't true. Um, that everybody came together and left their company affiliations behind and it was all. <laughs> That's not true. I can try. I was in the I, and, and so, right. And so, but I think from an individual perspective who cared deeply about open source, that there were people who, who did that. Um, and actually the people who were most at, most adamant about that, I actually felt like were often um, the most vulnerable to corporate influence. Mm. Um, and so I, I would often advocate uh, in my days in OpenStack to sort of say, look, I, I want to know your corporate influence. Don't hide it. I, we expect you to advocate for your company. Um, and I, I do think that, you know, companies don't know how to collaborate that well in these things and the people that are in them aren't necessarily given clear guidance and, and they're definitely not giving clear signals from their employers about that behavior, right? If, if I'm gonna go enable a feature, right? So Amazon just showed up in Kubernetes in a big way, which is great, um, but now you've got Red Hat who's gonna, who's sort of eyeing them and what they want to do with, with suspicion. Google definitely is like, whoa, wait a second, my project. <laughs> um, Right. Yeah. You know, Microsoft, Microsoft hired a whole bunch of amazing people and they're building a great team and they're coming in trying to do a whole bunch of stuff um, and saying, I mean, hey, that's that's Windows, but, but not only Windows. And so it's yes, this great melting plot, but uh, yeah. they're 
still corporate interests and they still need to have their own platform. And so when do they, when does Amazon sit down and say, this isn't a great feature for us. It's going to help Google a ton. Um, yeah. And how does that work with governance? And, and when all said now, yeah, you've got the largest committers to some of these projects being corporations, not individuals, you know, not this wonderful, cool group in China or these great people, you know, Italy or, it's it's Amazon versus Google versus Microsoft, you know, all, you know, wanting their stuff, this open source project to work really well in their cloud. But, uh, you know, it's, is it battle of the coders? Is it, uh, how does that, how does that work? Is it like a steel cage death match, you know, Mad Max style? Is, so <laughs> we have patterns for this, which is, you know, uh, standards bodies. Um, but one of the things that OpenStack did and this is actually going to drive us back to our, our question, so which is good because I want to watch time. Um, but uh, so we come back to our question. OpenStack made the decision that standard bodies were stupid. Um, just for <laughs> that sounds like a great um, T-shirt for, <laughs> for the next OpenStack well, summit. We know it like standard. <laughs> Except, right, because at the time, at the for historical context, at the time VMware was trying to promote a virtual a, a cloud standard. They they were trying to go through the IETF with cloud standards and everybody was terrified. Um, and Amazon didn't care. And so at the time we made a very deliberate decision that we were gonna drive it all through code, right? No standards, no design up front. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Code it, code it, code it, you make the code, 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 code. Um, which in some ways was refreshing and, and totally flawed. Um, <laughs> because because of this com this fundamental question, which is, the people coming through this project that understood what they were doing would would roll in or roll out. They change company affiliations, all sorts of weird things would happen and you were left with the code. Um, and so the idea that you could that, that you would rapidly evolve the API and the function set through changing the code, not through designing it up front and, and having a standards body. And I understand the attraction. But once that code was in place, the cost of changing it, the cost of right, uh, really pad deployments where you, you deploy uh, Fulsome and then you have to switch over to um, uh, Grizzly and then Havana. And there was no upgrade pattern because they were, we were moving fast and breaking things. Yeah, just run trunk. Um, who needs, uh, trunk. Who, need, Stay on trunk. <laughs> who needs standard? Um, and so, right, so, so it made it very hard for people. And then we also got into this, um, OpenStack, and I think Kubernetes is in the same challenge. It's not the API, it's the code. And if you're not running trunk code and, and the code, you you know you can't re, you can't rewrite OpenStack in Go, which was a popular conversation last year, um, <laughs> because it wouldn't be OpenStack. OpenStack is defined as the code for this very reason, um, which means the code has a lot of inertia, right? It carries, it carries a lot of, a lot of the community is actually in some, in, in a lot of ways carried through the code and it's very hard to change it. Yeah. And I think that goes back to the whole conversation about people getting hurt by, by you making changes or even suggesting changes because they've, especially now with the like, I mean, people have invested years and invested careers and companies in this. And so, yeah, there's a very real, uh, uh, challenge to changing code or even suggesting changing code. Uh, and, but to, to maybe to circle back to, to, to our original conversation, which was about that community needing to change and maybe to, to put a cap on this. What, what do you think that this is I mean, a great question. What do you think the community needs to do, Rob? <laughs> now that, oh, now that we're here. <laughs> um, then you wave your magic wand. You are now the you know the the guy way up high on the thing, and and you get to you know say no. This is a you know you get to be the Linus of OpenStack and say this is what we're going to do. So <laughs> <laughs> ah, I'm grumpy enough. No, um, you're you're way too friendly. You've never gotten a trash attack email from uh, Linus. You're right. Yeah, you, yeah, you could but, never. I don't, I don't send trash attack emails either. Um, I can share I, I my emails more. he sent me. I'll send you angry cat pictures. There you go. Um, angry cat. So, That's it. Um, so the, and this comes back to the, the heart of the, the, the problem. So I, I think that 
the core, right, it's, it's a core question. And projects themselves sh you know, should focus on small, tightly, especially open source, small, tightly defined boundaries for what they're going to do and do really well. Um, and re and they, this, is, this is where people talk about needing a benevolent dictator for life, the BDFL, um, <laughs> to sort of protect the, the essence of what that project needs to do. So like for OpenStack, an existential question is, um, you know, should it do more than VMs? Um, right? It, should it be a great, easy to use virtual machine scheduler and manager? Or does it need to do containers and metal and um, other things, right? And should it include a load balancer as a core part of the project or not? Should it include an auth system as a core part of the project or not? Um, and so I, I think that, and this is a, the, my favorite word here is adjacencies, um, that projects should be very focused on helping and helping in working with adjacencies, not replacing or absorbing adjacencies. Um, mm -hmm. but that means they're going to be smaller. Um, right. And, and Kubernetes, you know, might end up being, you know, is, is on track to be this big behemoth. Uh, but that's not, you know, it's not going to replace the container management. It's not replacing the operating system. It's not replacing, uh, load balancers. It's integrating with those things. Um, and those are separate projects and they're, and I think that's a very good model. Um, yeah, so it sounds like that it's it just it, it is an existential question when you talk about something like OpenStack, and uh, and I think it's people in communities or in, in any group. I mean, anytime you work in a group or you put time in, you know, part of you is in that whatever that is, whether it's a community or project yeah. application, you know, architecture. Your part of you is in that, and you're invested in that in some way. And then when someone comes in and says, maybe you know, maybe we need to change. This is all all back to that original piece when people don't like change even it's and it's fascinating to me even people in tech mm -hmm. who are there to change the world with every release you know, every push every day every commit you know you're gonna <laughs> move everything forward and maybe change all the closer things. to the vision but yeah but then if someone comes in and says well maybe you need to do it different they're like whoa 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 <laughs> i'm changing the world the world isn't changing me because <laughs> ah, i'm great. not gonna change so I love that. So I love that piece and I, I want to take it back into the core non-core because of this. If your scope is huge, you have a big area to defend. If your scope is small, then you can, and, and you're collaborating, right? You're looking at adjacencies and who do I play with? Who do I collaborate with? What do I, what do I work with? Then you're, you're, it's much harder to threaten your whole world by changing, right? Uh, rocket for Docker, or um, you know, it, it it helps you control the scope. OpenStack, in some ways, had you know, with Big Ten, established this huge space, and so they competed with everybody from a community. This is a community problem; it's not a code problem. Mm. No, I, I see, I see that because it it is because you're then you're you're vying for attention and effort and and talent from everyone, and and you end up with a you know, exactly what you were saying, which is, this is my way to do it. And, you know, there's, there's 10 right ways to do any of these, any of these work jobs. Um, and so if, if you're, if you, you know, uh, it's a statistical problem, right? If you've picked 10 right ways and they're all essential to what you're doing, um, you're down into a incredible, you're up into an incredibly high likelihood that one of those decisions was wrong. Yeah, um, and that can be hard to accept or, for a lot of people. Or doesn't or doesn't fit somebody's need. I'm I'm watching this with OpenStack and the Edge. There's a ton of people who want to do Edge infrastructure and OpenStack, and they keep starting the conversation with this: How do I fit OpenStack onto the Edge? Um, Is that even the right it, question? It, it, right, it's a horrible. It, to me, it's a hard. <laughs> I, I try to push back against it. Um, and if you, if anybody wants to get me on a rant in a meeting, just just start there um, <laughs> because because right it, it's a question of there's a whole bunch of adjacent technologies that need to get considered and wrapped into it and as a community and this is this i think is back to our central question is that our communities can be very defensive of the code we've worked and the, the hard you know what we've what we sort of put into it right the blood sweat and tears um to a point where 
they can create walls and boundaries and become hostile to other, 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 other communities. And, and the code is the anchor for that. Um, yeah, which I think is fascinating because I mean, when they, I'm, for, I'm sure when they first started developing, they were they were probably pushing against something that was already established, and they probably tried to tell someone else who had built something for years and, and put their blood, sweat, and tears, and they probably told them that it's wrong and it needs to change. And so instead of pushing, they went off and created something on their own, and then they become that same person they were pushing against. Uh, <laughs> I mean, this is just basic human nature 101. It's it's we're, we're built in a very specific way, and we we can't escape it in most cases. <laughs> and 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 coming back, and it's not about and coming back into that first question. So now we've got a community that's formed, right? And and I think that you people move in and out of jobs, they move in and out of communities, right? The stability, or if they're growing, you know, every OpenStack summit you. Have, it was double. So half the people who showed up were totally new. Um, so Kubernetes is going through the same growth curve. Um, in, in those cases, the, the community uh, might be incredibly volatile um, and confused and not know what it's defending and things like that. That, that code base can actually suffer through a much slower, um, we feel like it's going to change because there's no release, but it's, it actually is very, it's a lot of longevity to it. Is that, I, I, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm pulling this together. Maybe help me out, please. <laughs> I know. Uh, part of our debate I'm missing. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping my head around it now and I'm just kind of I'm thinking that it's, 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 you don't, you can't get away from the scale problem. Uh, and, and to your, to, to the point you just brought up before, which is, you know, the Kubernetes community is going through some of that same scale, that growth curve as the open source project. Once you get, you know, to that, you know, a certain point in that scale, you, a lot of the same things keep happening, no matter what you do, whether it's a company or a community, yeah. a project, uh, you just, you can't, you, things can only scale too much before you start getting a lot of the dysfunction that you've outlined all throughout this discussion. Uh, because when you get a certain number of people in a room, doesn't matter how good the governance is, uh, you're, you're going to have some of those issues. Uh, and I think what's, what's fascinating to me about the scale and scope and growth curves of some of these projects now is that it's it's not just a whole bunch of people who are like super excited and let's move fast and break things. It's a whole lot of big companies who are gonna throw dollars at it, AKA bodies and coders and chairs to go and see what happens when they move fast and break things. And, and maybe I need to move faster and break more things than, you know, than the other company. Uh, and, and then you have, you know, entities like China who are, who are just running everything on open source and just building teams around this. Uh, and then, you know, and then becoming sort of the largest, you know, contributors in certain projects because they have a vested interest. And then what happens then when, you know, all of a sudden the government of China literally is, you know, is who's subsidizing you know, a lot of the startups and, and innovation is now, you know, um, having a big hand. So like, how does Google, you know, you know, work on an open source project that, the government of China is, you know, is tangentially funding. Uh, I think that's that. That's what what really gets me fascinated when you start looking at at it from that perspective. So. I I would add one more thing that's the most interesting to me as someone who's run two open source communities is we don't learn. <laughs> I mean, it, it's like you know, is is, I, is our community learning? I, I you know I went to Zen and I learned a lot. I showed up at OpenStack and I said, well, here's what I know. And then everyone there's most, not everyone, but enough important people said, oh, forget it, we know. I'm like, well, I learned, and now here's Kubernetes. And, and you would think that the people there would have learned from OpenStack and all these communities, but it's almost as if we don't. And <laughs> maybe, <laughs> that, maybe that's <laughs> even, maybe that's companies, but my God, it's the same problems over and over again. We have a yeah. tendency to want to think that, that we, we're going to, learn better um, and, and to dismiss rather than in, embrace. And, and for me, one of the common denominators, and I guess where we started from all this stuff is it's the hallmark of success for a project is that it's deployed, that it goes into market, right? There's somebody operating it. Um, and I think when you look at that and you start thinking through what that means, you, you really have to turn around and say, we're not changing, you know, it, we can't change it as fast as we think as, you know, the code isn't just going to sort of whipsaw around. Successful projects have have inertia 
in what they do and that it's going to slow down the way you interact with it. It's going to change the community. and It's going to change the essence of the community uh, in good ways. Hopefully in good ways. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's, it's an, an essential perspective. And I think um, just to go back to what, uh, uh, what you were saying, um, Steve, is that, when when people come into things they don't they don't come in with the with the idea and the understanding and the humility that you know what i i don't a i, I don't know uh how to do everything and b you know eventually we're going to be dysfunctional or it's going to be dysfunction and when people talk about moving fast and breaking things um i think there's also a lot of lack of process innovation and a lot of lack of governance innovation and management innovation a lot of that and i think because because people are so focused on the technology innovation that's like they don't innovate the way that you know that they that they collaborate they don't innovate the way that they interact with other human beings and so you and you don't come into a project or starting something new with that humility um and of saying you know what i there's going to be the same dysfunction or i know there's going to be problems with communication i know there's going to be problems with governance and you just everyone just wants to you know at least some my perspective you'll let a lot of people just get excited and that excitement sort of you know turns into sort of the this this maybe just a it's putting blinders on and, and not really looking forward and looking ahead to those problems as, as they come so i i think i'm going to close with a question just to aggravate everyone and you guys are going to jump up and down but i'll close anyway because uh i love to close and leave things open since rob always does because he has 80 topics to continue on and my job is to close but but i think i'll just close with the statement that all open source communities should be run with benevolent dictator and to think otherwise is foolish and um that will that will be how I close it, and everyone can hear. Uh, exactly. The, the let the hate <laughs> tweets <laughs> and you now. But we're, you're not. You're not. To... You know what? Steve? You're not totally wrong. And that's I, the thing is, you're not. To, that's not totally wrong. The, the benevolent dictator model is not totally wrong, and and I know that's controversial. And let that sink into people. I just look at what works, and <laughs> and, and that's what I say. Well, well, Yadon, it has been great to have you, and. Um, you know, it was fun today because it was really all talking open source and, and I love talking open source. And so, you know, we try for our listeners to go up and down the technology spectrum, a variety of topics. And, you know, having you here was great. Again, uh, you're welcome to uh, your podcast. is called Welcome to the Tech Village. We encourage our listeners to go check it out. And, um, and then if you listen to, uh, you know, listen to those five, six times, the same one, do that for us too. So our uh, podcast listen counts will go up. That's right. I'm watching and they're, they're beating us. So I'm disappointed, but um, yeah. Then if people want to reach out to you, um, you know, what's your Twitter handle? Where should they go? Uh, you can reach out to me at Porter de Leon on Twitter. Um, and also you can check out uh, the level up project at tech underscore level up. If you're interested in creating a uh, creating content for the community. Uh, and uh, Steve and Rob, this has been fantastic and awesome conversation. I've, I've been really enjoying listening to, to your podcast and, uh, and the wonderful conversations you have with so, so many amazing people. And it just, it gets me fascinated. So I, I can't tell you how much uh, I appreciate you having me on. Feeling is mutual. You guys are doing a great job on your, yeah, so well, thank you. Thanks again. And to our listeners, if you didn't listen to the Plamondon podcast, what are you waiting for? Oh my goodness. You got to watch, you got to listen to that. I mean, I tracked him down to Cambodia. I don't think people oh, understand. The, that's the greatest he's live from cambodia <laughs> and he was you could even hear like the little motorcycles go by it's great fun well thanks again everyone uh for joining us and listening and uh we'll talk to you again soon thank you